Not our mamas. All right, we're talking about uh, the high priest in uh, Hebrews chapter 5. And just kind of wanted to start on this slide. It just kind of set in your mind um, that Christ is our high priest. And he's the high priest of our confession. And he's seated on the throne of our heart. And, you know, you, you, in the Old Testament, the high priest would go into the, um, the Holy of Holies and on the Day of Atonement once a year and, and do his work. And, you know, but, but now Christ is, is fulfilling that role. So let's just go to the Lord in prayer before we get into the scripture and begin our little study. Lord, we ask, Lord, that you'll just bless our study this morning and bless all the ones that are, uh, like Brother Terrence said, that are traveling, Brother Wade and Brother Luis, Lord, as they're ministering this, this, uh, this morning. We ask that you'll just be with us today, Lord God, and help us, Lord, as we come expecting to receive from you. In the name of the Lord Jesus. <clears throat> so Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1 says, For every high priest taken from among men is ordained for men. <clears throat> so Paul's setting in our mind, he begins to set what, what a high priest is and and uh, how a high priest is, is called, is called of God. It's not somebody that, that says, well, I, I think that I would, I would like to do this job. It's somebody that God has ordained for that purpose. And the high priest, is, his job is to ordain for men and things pertaining to God that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. And sometimes it's a little bit easier to read another translation. So I've got a, another translation, the Berean Study Bible. Um, some, well, somebody was asking me recently, is it okay to read other translations? And I, I say, if, if it'll help you. <laughs> yeah, sometimes the King James Version has, um, you know, we don't, we don't really think in the way that they, it's, it's written sometimes. So it helps to kind of pull up another, another version a little bit and, and compare things. Of course, you know, you've got to be careful, but um, anything that'll help, I'm in favor of. Um, so the Berean Study Bible says every high priest is appointed from among men to represent them in matters relating to God to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. And the King James Version goes on and says, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. So in other words, uh, we've got a high priest that, look, so in the Old Testament, the high priest was, was, was somebody like them that that had his own weaknesses and had his own struggles and things. But now I, I, Jesus is a high priest that has no sin, but yet he went through, he, he was tempted like we are. And he, he uh, you know, uh, like in the Prince of the House of David, the author there said that he had a headache there at the tomb of Lazarus. And, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and so he, he know he understands what we're going through. Whether you're, no matter where you are in life, if you're a young child, he, he was a child, so he knows the struggles of a child. If you're a teenager, he understands the struggles of a teenager and knows the, the, the you know, uh, how, how maybe adults uh, seem to misunderstand you sometimes and all of those kind of things. He, and it, 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 what a blessing it is to, when we, go, when we go to prayer, we have somebody that we can reach out to that knows what, what's, what's happening, what we're dealing with. And so it says, by reason hereof, he awed us for the people, so also for himself, to offer sins. And, and Paul goes on to say, and no man taketh this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So now Jesus, of course, you know, uh, he, he, all through his ministry, he would, he would, uh, he would kind of go back to, you know, I didn't, I'm not, I'm not putting myself into this situation. I'm not, I'm not saying these things of myself, but it's actually God bearing witness of me and anybody that's called of God, they don't, they don't put themselves into that role. <clears throat> You go back to Exodus 28 and it says when, when God actually called Aaron to the role of the high priest and he said, take thou unto the Aaron, thy brother. Now look, Aaron, Aaron it wasn't because Aaron uh, was a particularly great person or, or anything like that, or, uh, but God, God chose him to, to fulfill the role of the high priest and all of his sons. So he called them. And so we just want to dwell on what a calling is for a few minutes that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Arab, Nadab, and Abihu, Eliezer, and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. So Aaron was set aside to fulfill that role that God, a, a calling of God is, is something where God is, God is, God is a supernatural thing where God is moving on the scene to draw somebody into a place that he wants them to be in. 
Now you say, oh well, it's a minister you're talking about. I'm, I'm talking about I'm talking about anybody. If he's drawing you, maybe this morning speaking to your heart, it's God calling you to be a Christian. God drawing you into the spot that He wants you to be in. And so he, we're we're hewn like a, like those um, those blocks that went into the, the the temple that that Solomon built. God draws us and then hews us out and puts us right where He wants us to go. So, you know, uh, when, you're, when you're born again, maybe he'll begin to speak to your heart and say, well, I, I want you to preach the gospel. And you begin to feel like maybe there's, maybe there's something, a, a call in my life, and he's drawing you. It's God drawing you and pulling you, not yourself, drawing you to put you into a place. So and uh, the, maybe, the, maybe the, one, the greatest example of a call of God is in Isaiah, where Isaiah, you know, he'd been looking at Uriah and looking at men and then uh, at what other people are doing. And finally, God had got him to a place where he pulled him off to the side and, and showed, him the, showed him what his real influence should be, as Brother Brown preached in that sermon, influence. And it, the seraphim took a coal of fire off of the altar and he laid upon his mouth and said, Lo, this had touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? So, so God's wanting somebody. That, there's, uh, when God calls you, there's got to be, you've got to respond. It, it, when he calls you, it's not, he's not forcing you. To, he's not going to force you to be a Christian. He's not going to force you to be a preacher. He's not going to force you to be a deacon, whatever that is. But he, uh, he, he wanted Isaiah to say, I, I'll go, I'll do it. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. So uh, Jesus was called, he was, he was called because it was God moving in him to be our high priest and to fulfill, uh, you know, how could, how could anybody of themselves go up on the cross and die and do all of those things? But yet God, it was God, the life of God in him down, down veiled within that flesh to go, to go minister for us and to perform the, 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 the deeds of a high priest and to be, to be our high priest, to, to live the life and to preach the gospel and all those, all those things. But let's just meditate for a few moments on, on, on what some other great preachers have said about being called. Now, I, I, I love some of these quotes that I, as I was kind of doing some research. David Livingston said, If a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? And Robert Dabney said, The true doctrine of calling is that the man whom God has designed and qualified to preach learns his call through the word. Now, that's a powerful quote right there. Let's, let's sit on that for a second. Now, because you know that goes for a Christian too. Now you know you you when you're called of God and you you uh, you start coming to church and uh, along and along you you begin to maybe wonder if you're born again and what's going on and but uh, you 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 begin to get surety from the Word. The Word is where actually you you begin over time it as it begins to open up to you you begin to identify yourself and your life and what God has done with you by the Word. So maybe somebody would say, well, how do, how do I know if I'm called to preach? How do I know if I'm called that you, you look into the word and the word is what identifies your calling? The true doctrine of calling is that the man whom God has designed and qualified to preach learns his call through the word. The word is the instrument by which the spirit teaches him with prayer that he is to preach. The word is the thing that, that identifies your calling. Maybe, maybe that's kind of a, 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 it's a really profound thing. But I, I found that to be true when you, when you get into a rough spot and you're wondering what, what's, what's happening in your life. You go back to the word and the word is what proves things out. When you can begin to look in your life and see that your life lines up with, with, with a, your life parallels the stories that you're reading in the Bible of David and all these all these great men, and you can see your life played out in the story of Rahab, then you begin to get confidence that your life is going in the right path, that you're walking in the light of God's word. <clears throat> Martin Lord James said, Jones, Martin Lloyd Jones said it was Mr. Spurgeon, I believe, who used to say to young men, if you can do anything else, do it. <clears throat> if you can do anything else, do it. Because if you're doing it of your own self to be popular or for fame or for money or, or to, to, to be a great person, you're doing it for the wrong thing. If you can stay out of the ministry, stay out of the ministry. I would certainly say that without any hesitation whatsoever. 
I would say that the only man who is called to preach is the man who cannot do anything else in the sense that he is not satisfied with anything else. This call to preach is so put upon him and such pressure comes to bear upon him that he says, I can do nothing else. I must preach. Now, it doesn't that compare with what Isaiah was saying that, yeah, what are you, because what are you doing? You're, you're preaching because, because you want to help somebody. You want to help somebody get out of their, out of their, uh, their eggshell, say it like that. And that's how, that's how any calling is. When you're called of God to be a Christian, there's something motivating you that you can't, you can't not, you, it, it's pulling you to, to get out of the world, to get out of your, your, the way that you think, to, uh, you get to a place of desperation where you've, you've got to move on with God. And Martin Lord Jones said, I, I have always felt when someone has come to me and told me that he has been called to be a preacher, that my main business is to put every conceivable obstacle that I can think of in his way. Isn't that a strange thing? Because you don't want somebody that's trying to promote their self or their own idea. And you know, uh, being preacher, being a preacher is, uh, well, well I, think, I think one of these other quotes references that, so I'll just hold on for a second. And John Newton said, none but he who made the world can make a minister of the gospel. If the young man has capacity, culture, and application, it may make him a scholar, a philosopher, or an orator, but a true minister must have certain principles, motives, feelings, and aims, which no industry or endeavors of men can either acquire or communicate. They must be given from above where they, they cannot be received. Now see, how, see why Jesus was called of God? He was called because that was God actually walking in him and doing. He, he was God manifested in the flesh. And the things that he did and the words that he spoke, that, you know, the people that listened to him said, no man, I've never heard a man talk like this before. Because it was God using his mouth and using his, his uh, it, it, it was, he was God manifested in the flesh, Amen. manifested for us. Right. <clears throat> and J.C. Philpott said, those whom God calls to the work, he usually, yeah, here's the quote I wanted to get to. <clears throat> those whom God calls to the work. He usually so strips and empties, so pulls down, humbles and abases, so shows them what the ministry is and their own unfitness for it, that they shrink back from so arduous and important a work and can scarcely be persuaded that they are called to it. You know, there's, there's a pattern in there that it, when God, for God to really put a stone where it needs to go, first, it's got to be, it's got to be, uh, it has to go through some low points. Now, you think about the life of Christ when, when he was rejected and they, they rejected his word and, and, and uh, struck his back and put him on the cross. When they rejected his message, that actually put him where he was supposed to be, on the cross, to fulfill his word. Now, even today, when the word was rejected, when Brother Brown preached, I indict this generation for rejecting the word, that, then that place, that actually moved the word to where it was supposed to be. It placed it. So even in your own life, for the word to actually be put into effect, really the way it's supposed to be in your life, you got to come to a really low place where you realize that even in your own self, there's nothing, there's nothing that you can do. You have to rely completely on God. So many times God will take you down to it. And maybe this is not just, I'm not just talking about ministers, but just everybody to, but, but also especially ministers that to really, to really be effectual, he'll bring you down to a low place where you think you, you think all sorts of things. <laughs> he strips, so strips and empties, so pulls down, humbles and abases, so shows them what the ministry is and their own unfitness for it, that they shrink back from so arduous and important a work and can scarcely be persuaded that they are called to it. Amen. We need hardly remark how different this is from the forward, pushing, bold, if not presuming spirit, which so many manifest in their ambitious aim almost to force their way into the pulpit. So God wants somebody that can't do it, that can't do it of their own self to preach the gospel. J.C. Ryle said, I felt shut up to do it and saw no other course of life open to me. I couldn't help to do it. I couldn't help but do it. And C.H. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon said, he that can toy with his ministry and counter to be like a trade or like any other profession was never called of God. But he that has a charge pressing on his heart and a woe ring, ringing in his ear and preaches as though 
He heard the cry, oh, excuse me, the cry of hell behind him and saw his God looking down on him. Oh, how well, that man entreats the Lord that his hearers may not hear in vain. <clears throat> Whatever call a man may pretend to have, if he has not been called to holiness, he certainly has not been called to the ministry. I think that's another thing that maybe maybe sometimes ministers forget about is that it, when Brother Brown preached in the message influence, that if you're called to preach the gospel, you're called to a life of holiness so that you can have an influence with the people. Because, you know, there's so many that have fallen by the wayside because they got caught up in things and, and we're not living a life that, you know, if Paul, if Paul could say that, that uh, if it's going to offend somebody to, to eat meat, I'm not going to do it, then how much bolder we should be to, 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 to try to have an influence where we, we stay away from things that will, will cause people to stumble. Because a calling of God is something to be, something. It's, it's, it's an honorable thing. And that's why Paul said, And no man take this honor unto himself, but he that is called of God as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to, to be made in high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. So in John chapter 8, Jesus answered, If I honor myself, and isn't that true of any, if any man, any, any preacher, sometimes, you know, we, 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 maybe we get, uh, we get a little bit sidetracked sometimes and start thinking that, that uh, our goal is to have people follow us or look at us. But our goal is to point back at Jesus Christ. Our goal is to point at him. And so it doesn't matter how popular you are or how unpopular you are or how many people uh, look at you strange while you're preaching or don't look at you strange or getting it or not getting it. What matters is that we're preaching the gospel. So he said, I, if I honor myself, my honor, Jesus is our example now, my honor is nothing. It is my Father that honoreth me, of whom ye say that he is your God. Yet ye have not known him, but I know him. And if I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you. But I know him and keep his saying. And again in John chapter 7, and Jesus answered him and said, My doctrine is not mine, but his that sent me. See how, see how he is our example. Because this is how we, we preach. That this is not this is not even the doctrine of William Branham. That this is the doctrine of the Father that we're preaching. This is not my doctrine, but when we preach the words off of the page and to make it a living reality, to you this it's, it's His that sent us. If any man will do His will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. He that speaketh of himself seeketh his own glory. But he that seeketh his, his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in, is, is in him. You see how, do you see why God will take a minister and, and mold them down into where they, they, they're just nothing? Until they can't, they can't do it of themselves because they're, not, they're to a place where they're not looking for, for praise or glory or anything because he that seeketh his glory that sent him, the same is true, and no unrighteousness is in him. And Jesus said in John chapter 8, And I seek not mine own glory. There is one that seeketh and judgeth. And that's what Paul was talking about here when he says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself. Jesus came on the scene as our example, an example of as our high priest, to take a, somebody that we can have confidence in, that he was, uh, he was everything that, uh, that we can rely on. In John chapter 5, 31, he said, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bare witness unto the truth. See, he had a forerunner, a forerunner to forerun the coming of the Son of Man. But he said, But I receive not testimony from man. So he's not looking for somebody to give him praise and, 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 and to, to give him pats on the back. And tell him whether or not his sermon was good. He said, but these things I say that you might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light and you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have greater witness than that of John. You see what he's saying? He said, now I've got a man to testify of me, that my, that, of who I am, to, that proclaim. But, but now I'm not relying on that so much. 
I've got a greater witness than that of John. And that greater witness, like, like how Paul said, we've got a greater, uh, 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 well, I'm, I'm, I'm drawing a blank at the scripture. A greater witness than that of John for the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. When he's doing the will of the Father, the works of the Father, and God's life was made manifest in him so that the people could see that the eyes of the blind were open and, and the, the lame walked and people heard the word and they, he, he broke the loaves and the fishes and God's life was manifested in him. I've got a greater witness than that of John. So he was our high priest. Now in the Old Testament, the primary purpose of the high priest was to serve as a representative and mediator as a representative and a mediator between the people and Yahweh. It was the high priest's responsibility to see that the covenant was enforced. Now, now set this in your mind that don't maybe look so much at, think about Jesus walking on the shores of Galilee, but he's our high priest now, yes. seated in our heart to do what? To see that the covenant is enforced. Right. So he's in your heart actually living it out He's, it, when you do wrong, he's, he's there to say, you shouldn't have talked to that person that right that, that way. You need, to, you need to repent. He's there to open up the word to you because he's, he's our high priest. As the representative for the nation of Israel, the high priest had a tremendous responsibility to direct the hearts, to change your heart toward God and the fulfillment of the covenant. So he's the high priest seated in our heart now. Like in the Old Testament, how the high priest would go through that outer court, inner court, holy of holies. Well, now our high priest has done those, done that work to go into our, into our heart, yes. to change our hearts, to see that the covenant is enforced, and to be a representative, a mediator between God and man. Throughout the Old Testament, there is a foreshadowing and forward-reaching hope of a more perfect high priesthood that can represent God effectively and be a sufficient mediator for the people of Israel. The cyclical pattern of the lives of good and poor high priests makes it clear that no human being can fully perform his responsibility. So Paul goes on to say, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard and that he feared. He's a priest. Now, Paul, Paul doesn't really get into Melchizedek until Hebrews chapter 7, but we're kind of leading up to that. So he's saying, he's trying to set in our minds that, that they had a high priest after the order of Aaron, a, a man that could die and would go in and out of the Holy of Holies, and every year he had to go, go in and out. But now we're changing over to a priest after the order of Melchizedek, a, 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 a priesthood where once into the Holy of Holies is fine, it, it, it finishes the work. And this, as Melchizedek came in the flesh and was manifest to, uh, and ministered to Abraham and talked to Abraham in the flesh, so Jesus, God was manifested in the flesh of Jesus. And in the days of his flesh, as Paul is saying, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears. And again, what's he talking about? He's talking about a man that got crushed there in the Garden of Gethsemane. A man that, that, uh, that uh, you know, I got the little picture there crying out to God, Father, let this cup pass for me. So who may set, set in, get, start setting in our mind, who is this Melchizedek? Who was that Melchizedek? When we, I get, just got a little picture to show that Melchizedek laying his hands on Abraham and blessing him. And as brother, you know, we were just listening to Brother Branham explain it in that sermon before, I, before the lesson, that Melchizedek was God in flesh. That God pulled up around that theophany, he pulled up around all that, the potash and the petroleum and all of that and walked out there and had communion with Abraham and sat there and talked with him and identified that he was God by, by saying, uh, where's Sarah? And telling him what she was thinking and, 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 and discerning things and telling Abraham, got up and walked with him and looked over at Sodom and Gomorrah when he, when he came and visited him later and showed him the things that were going to happen. But we'll get to that a little bit more when we get to Hebrews chapter 7. Hebrews chapter 5, where we are, he says, Paul says, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. 
And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him, called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience. Now you think, how, how could Jesus learn? Think of a little baby. A little baby can't preach. But as a, as a little baby keeps eating, after a while it can start babbling. And after a while, that little baby that, that's babbling, after a while it can, it can learn to follow some direction and get out of the road and gets a little popping from his mama when it runs in the road and it, it keeps on growing. So he learned by obedience, by the things which he suffered. He got a little popping from his mama if he maybe uh, played in the road or did something like that. But I, I think one of the examples I, I like to use, uh, there's, this, there's this thing that psychologists like to do with young people, w with little kids, and, and that's the, the picture I have as, as we're just closing up right here. Uh, that they'll ask a little kid, if I, a little child, if, if I put water in this, in this tall glass and then pour it into this little short squat glass, is it the same amount of water? And a child cannot tell you that it's the same amount of water because they don't have that capacity yet. They're, they're not yet at that place to, to be able to say it's the same amount of water. But, but you, you do that to a teenager as the musicians come forward. A teenager will say that's the same amount of water. The older you get, the more capacity you have. And the, the older that Jesus got in the flesh, the more capacity he had to receive revelation from the Father. And the more, the older he got, the more he learned. And he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, the things he went through as God put him into the place that he wanted, wanted him to be in. And we'll just stop right there as we continue on. God bless you, saints.